any questions on, so I put out that you should be working, certainly working through the problems and problem set one that are associated with chapter one. Any questions on any of those? We have one on the yeah. No sound? It's green. Hello? Hello? Yeah? Yeah, any questions on problem set one? Anything that's confusing you all? What was the answer to the Piazza question about the... Uh, why was vector v in the first problem not a function of q3? That's a figure. And on the next page, it's got a vector v defined. b1, unit vector b1 plus unit vector b2, c2 plus unit vector d3. All right, so b1, c2, and d3. C2 and D3, V1, C2, and D3. <clears throat> and the question is, is uh, you know, what scalar variables is, are, is uh, that vector a function of? What are those? <clears throat> B1, C2, and D3. Is this a function of Q2? Let's start with Q1. Is it a function of Q1? And why not? Yeah, so B and A, uh, reference frames A and B, are <coughs> connected via this, um, or this Q1, it defines the orientation with respect to, um, between these two frames. And <coughs> if we only have a vector that exists in B, C, and D, <coughs> um, you can move... You could imagine maybe if I changed Q1, A would wiggle around, um, but we wouldn't see any of these unit vectors changing, right? I could wiggle A through different values of Q1, <coughs> but none of those unit vectors are going to change, right? What about Q2? Is, it, is this a function of Q2? Chris? 
Chris? Yeah, so the uh, unit vectors in C could potentially be expressed in B, and they would be a function of two, Q2. Would all of them be a function of Q2? All the unit vectors in C? If I'm C1. C1 would? C3 would. What about C2? No. C2 is the essentially the axis that you're rotating about. So I can change Q2. And C2 is always equal to B2. <clears throat> All right, so Q3. Is Q3, is this vector a function of Q3? I mean, uh, yeah, Q3. Somebody else got an answer. If you guys don't get more lively, I'm going to call on people. So think about the same reasoning that I just said about C2, and then ask yourself, is Q3, um, is V dependent on Q3? Scott? Yeah, so it's D3 and C3 are the same same unit vector. They have the same orientation, length, direction. <clears throat> and if we were to change Q3, uh, this, this vector is not going to change. So this unit vector is not going to change relative to these other, other two. So the only one that's a function there uh, is, is Q2, this particular vector. And if you were to express, you know, these <clears throat> all in the B frame, um, you would end up with some cosines and sines of Q2, but you wouldn't see cosines and sines of Q1 or Q3. And we could check that later. Okay. So do those homework problems and um, certainly... Ask, we have some questions ready. Uh, we're going to start into Chapter 2 today. So you want to get, get through those homework problem 1s and start moving into the problem set from Chapter 2 also. Okay? So I saw 2 on the Piazza. Somebody said that this was... Um, I'm using this surface so that I can easily record the notes, but... I don't have a bunch of boards to keep them on on the screen the whole time. So, um, c tell me to slow down if you want if if I'm too fast and you want to take notes. Um, but also, it might you know I don't know how you, everybody ha is different about this, but maybe you can you can also potentially listen and uh, and the notes will be available and just write down extra points that I don't write down or something. However you want to handle that. But if you want me to slow down, you got to tell me, and I'll try to be a little more conscious of that. Um, <clears throat> so, we're going to get into, we've talked about differentiating vectors and reference frames last time, and now we're going to start talking about kinematics. And I'm using a different version of OneNote here, so bear with me while I make sure I figure out how to do this. And I think maybe the horizontal, if I do landscape pages, maybe that's uh, better. Maybe I can do two columns so we can keep some things on the board. I'll try that too. We'll see how that works. Okay, so today um, we're going to start about talk about kinematics. And in particular, we're, gonna, we're dealing with two types of things, a, a particle and a rigid body in this class. And when we speak about kinematics of particles and rigid bodies, um, F equals MA and some of the moments equals the time derivative of the angular momentum, Newton, Newton's second law and Euler's equations. 
uh, define that we need a second derivative of position. So the kinematics for a particle, um, if we think about Newton's second law, we're going to have a position vector, a velocity vector, and a acceleration vector. So we really don't need to take any more derivatives after acceleration because the magic law of nature, F equals ma, um, taking three to two derivatives is sufficient. So for a given particle, <clears throat> we'll, we'll be interested in this position, velocity, acceleration, all, all linear, right? So these are linear motion. I don't know if I'm going to do a good job doing two columns. I'll try. And then a rigid body, <clears throat> um, as a corollary, we have uh, that all the points on a rigid body have particle kinematics. Now there's an infinite amount of particles on a rigid body, but each one of them also has a position vector that locates those. They also have um, angular position. So if we look at those particles as a group, we can um, think about how they have uh, angular position or, or sometimes called orientation. And then, um, I guess I want to write like this. this. That would be one. And then two, uh, angular velocity. And three, angular acceleration. An angular acceleration is ultimately need to form Euler's equation for the balance of the, some of the moments with respect to the inertia times the acceleration, essentially. All right. So these are the main uh, kinematics. Once we get these vectors, these a angular acceleration vectors and the, ang and the linear acceleration vectors, um, then all we got to do is deal with the inertia and the forces and the torques and the moments, uh, which we'll talk about later. But the hardest part of dynamics, I think, is getting the kinematics right. <clears throat> and it's tricky because um, there, things are complex. We have complex geometries, complex motion, and being able to nail the kinematics is the first step to um, succeeding in developing a model for some kind of system. And it's going to take typically the most amount of time um, working those out. So we're going to spend more time practicing this and thinking about it. Um, the <clears throat> we'll start with um, the rigid body orientation instead of the linear. We'll, and, um, and the reason for that is is the uh, orientation pl plays a critical role in figuring out linear position vectors too. So let's, let's start with uh, rigid body, not batty, rigid body orientation. Um, another, another third word, for, you've got angular position, orientation, and um, you also may hear the word attitude also. The um, attitude of satellite, it's usually it's often used in space more often, but uh, attitude, or orientation, and angular position are all synonyms. So first, suppose that two reference frames, A and B, with fixed coordinate systems, A1, A2, defined by these unit vectors, B1, B2, and B3 uh, looks something like this. And I'll, let's see how this works. If I divide my page, get a little more space over here, um, I'm going to draw A here. And actually, let me draw more like that. So do A2, A3, and A1. This is a right hand 
defined coordinate system. These are mutually perpendicular um, unit vectors. And then I might have some other um, reference frame, B, here to the right. I'll have B1, B3, and B2. Okay? Let me adjust that one a little. So these two reference frames are oriented relative to each other in some fashion. If I sort of look at how maybe one of the unit vectors in B projects, let me see if I can change colors, into reference frame A, right, it may look something like that. And <clears throat> this reference frame B1 has some angle relative to each of those other unit vectors. So if I look at um, A2, maybe I can say there's a alpha 2 that relates B1 to A2, a alpha 3 scalar that relates is the angle between A3 and B1, and then a alpha 1 that's the angle between A1 and B1, right? So we can think about that these three angles fix B1 in, a, in the A-frame, and that we can, if we know those angles, we know the relative orientation between the two reference frames. So the question then is, um, how can we describe the orientation of B, reference frame B, relative to A? Okay, and, and this is a potential way, right? So I can use the angle angles between B1, B2, and B3 um, with respect to A1, A2, and A3. All right, so we would need a set of angles for each of the B unit vectors, right? So that would give us a total of nine values. Now, so does there, um, anybody not have that first page there? I want that. So let's add a new page. Um, <clears throat> so you could then write B1 that we just expressed as the cosine of alpha 1 times A1 plus the cosine of alpha 2, A2, plus the cosine of alpha 3, A3. Right? And that cosine comes from the fact that we can project that particular B1 vector into the A frame. And if those are the angles in between it, that projection is going to give us a cosine of alpha as the scalar value of each of those um, components of the vector B1 expressed in the A-frame. And just as a reminder of that, right, so this cosine alpha 1 is B1 dotted with A1. B1 dotted with A1, if they're both unit vectors, right, you get the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. So we can think of those as these projections, B1 dotted with A2 in the A2 direction, plus B1 dotted with A3 in the A3 direction. All right, so that's B1 expressed in the A-frame in terms of these angles that we've defined. You can write this out for 
B2, and I'll use um, beta 1 for the B2 uh, values. Beta 3. And then B3. Use gamma for the um, final angles. So there we have three equations, three vector equations, for each of the Bs expressed in the A frame. And all of the components have these measure numbers that are the cosines of these nine angles. <clears throat> um, you can also write this in sort of a matrix form. Right, if I write B1, B2, B3, there on the left, then I can translate this into a linear, right, they're all, all these scalars are linear in the A vectors. And if I fill those in, cosine alpha 1, heat would go here, cosine alpha 2, cosine alpha 3, etc. I'm going to use a shorthand, cosine 1, 1, cosine 1, 2, cosine 1, 3, cosine 2, 1, Cosine 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1, 3, 2, and 3, 3. Right? This matrix, you've probably seen it before, um, we're going to call it a direction cosine matrix. You may have another, other words for it, um, <clears throat> transformation matrix, rotation matrix, right? But they relate the unit vectors of two reference frames that are oriented relative to each other uh, with this matrix of nine cosines, cosines of nine angles. And it is the direction cosine matrix of B relative to A. Getting sloppy. Right? And then I'll fill in this space right here, but Cij is the cosine of the angle between the ith B and the ith A unit vector. Okay? Direction cosine matrix. So that's how I typically refer to them. Uh, but these are going to be crucial to relate any reference frame that's oriented different to another reference frame to each other. Any questions on, on that? How we come up with that? No? Okay, direction cosine matrix. Everybody got that one? Chris? Uh, if you wanted to go, like, say you had a third reference frame under that matrix, change it all. So if you wanted to go from, say, like, say, like, you know, A over to C, you know, you have to kind of translate through the Well, say I had, if I had uh, A, B, and C, and they're sort of chained together, B's in, the betw in between A and C, right? C still has some orientation relative to A. And if I know the angles between C and A, then that matrix is that matrix. But it's often difficult to know the angles, especially maybe I have 20 reference frames chained, and they're all rotated in different ways. 
um, it's not trivial to know just the angle between reference frame C, uh, A10 and the reference frame A1, right? So then you can walk through them, and you can form sort of the simpler equation for, for each successive rotation of a reference frame. And then um, you'll have one of these for every couple of reference frames. And it turns out, and we'll show this uh, more explicitly later, but uh, you can matrix multiply all of those together to get, the refer to get the direction cosine matrix you would have gotten if you knew the angles between A1 and A10. All right? And we'll show how that works. All right, new page. Okay, <clears throat> let's uh, look at a little example here and think about the reference frames. So if I have, I'm just going to say I have a merry-go-round. We're looking at it from the top. And it is attached to the ground and rotates about its center relative to the ground. And the ground I'm going to call uh, reference frame N. So that's the ground. And so I'll have an N1 and an N2, um, or uh, mutually perpendicular unit vectors that represent the ground frame. <clears throat> right? And then this disk, which is the merry-go-round, is uh, going to rotate. If I can remember to use colors, it's going to rotate through some angular velocity omega. <laughs> omega. <clears throat> and it has a reference frame attached to it. that we'll call B. Right? And so it rotates through an angle theta as it spins. And uh, when theta equals 0, B1 is aligned with N1, and B2 is aligned with N2. Um, we will think about a vector P. There's one more color. So I'm going to draw a vector P here in the direction of B1. And the magnitude of P equals R, some radius of that particular, uh, this merry-go-round. And if we're concerned with potentially this a point, I'll call P, and then I'm going to call the center O. We might be concerned with you know what the velocity of that point P is for some reason. And if you recall from your Dynamics 101, you will remember that um, the velocity vector of a rotating vector like this is always going to be pointing perpendicular to it. So if I want the velocity of point P and it's rotating with an omega, I've got some velocity vector P there. Um, the other thing that I'll instate is that omega is a constant here. Uh, so that means that um, theta equals omega times t, right? And then I also mentioned that when theta is at its um, is 0, um, the initial angle is, is 0. So if this is a uh, theta naught represents the initial theta, and that's going to be 0. All right, so we've got this little rotating merry-go-round, merry and we're interested in, in some of these vectors that we've written out. And I, I think I used the wrong, I meant to call this... Uh, the P R bar, so I don't get confused in my notes. R bar, and then the magnitude of R bar is R. All right? 
So if we want to write out the vector r bar, we know pretty straightforward that I can take r cosine theta to project that down into the n1 frame, and I get r cosine theta n1 plus projected into the n2 r sine theta n2. So that's r expressed in the n frame. But I could also express r in the b frame. So r is also equal to the, and I use big R up here. Let's change it. I'm screwing up my notes. Um, little r. R times B1, right? So if I'm standing on B and I want to write that in, in B frame, it's just R times B1. But if I'm standing on N, right, R is now moving, and I have to express it in terms of theta, that one scalar value. Right, so this this implies that you know R is fixed in B. And um, our velocity vector V bar, we can also write that in terms of B. And it, if, from our dynamics 101, is um, in the B2 direction of some magnitude B. But we can also write that in terms of the, if I project V into N1 and N2, I would get V times negative sine theta N1 plus cosine theta N2. All right, so I can express both of those vectors in the, in the N frame or the B frame. And one of them, you know, express it in the B frame, it's very short and simple. And if I express it in the in frame a little longer and a little more complicated. So if I were to take the um, time derivative, the total time derivative of r, the position vector, with respect to t in the b frame, what would I get? Is R, is R changing if I'm standing in the V-frame, viewing it from the B-frame? I think i got to an answer here in the corner. What's your name? Steve. Steven or Steve? Steven or Steve? 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 Steven. Sorry. Okay, Steven, what do you think? No. So the time derivative of R in the B-frame is going to be zero, right, because since it's fixed. <clears throat> but what if we want the time derivative of r with respect to t in the n frame? <clears throat> Is that going to be zero? No, it will not not be zero. If I'm standing in the n frame, right? I'm seeing this vector pass pass around and move, so it's it's it has some it's changing with respect to time. And we've already told you that this is equal to this vector v bar, which is v, v2, some magnitude, and also can be expressed right in the end frame. Sine theta in 1 plus v cos theta in 2. In a, in a, We've got the time derivative of the same vector in two different frames, and the key takeaway there is that um, the time derivative of r bar with respect to t in b does not equal the time derivative of r bar with respect to t in n. Okay? So we have to be acutely aware that that is always the case and be very careful um, about these time derivatives. So everybody got, anybody not have this sheet? Yes. Yeah. So <clears throat> what I typically do to figure that out, you know, I see the V bar up there, the little red one. Um, I'm going to sketch right here in the corner. If I wrote N1, N2 hat, 
and I drew V bar, which I know is perpendicular to R bar from, our, from Dynamics 101, it's in the direction of B2, right? So this, I'll add B2 to it. Right? B2 is that direction. And B1 is this direction. This angle is theta, and so is this angle. So if I then project V into the N1, right, I now have negative, right, so I've got the sign is pointing in the, in the negative direction with respect to N1, this projection, and that distance then is the sign, right? So the sign of the length of V, which is a V bar, which is V, right, the length of that is V. Um, so I get V, negative V sine theta as that component. And then if I project it here, I get positive V cosine theta. Okay, so it's, take a, I draw this, like, like I mentioned last time, I draw this little sketch all the time because I never, I don't, I don't think I've ever memorized what, what it's supposed to be, but I just always draw the sketch and project, right, and draw your angles. <clears throat> and that should, it will always lead you to the right, uh, the right expression when you're trying to express one reference frame into another. And it's, for this simple rotation with a single angle, it's um, uh, you know, relatively easy to do. And the nice thing is that you, as the modeler, can try to set up these rotations so that you can think about them in a simple way, too, as you describe your different problems. Any other questions there? Okay. So um, now let, let's talk a little, let's talk specifically about what the angular velocity is. I'll write a little thing here, angular velocity of rigid body B, Bobby, in reference frame A has to do with the rate, rate of change of orientation of B and A. And now suppose that uh, B1, B2, B3 are right-handed set of mutually perpendicular unit vectors in B, fixed in B. Then the definition of angular velocity of, so this is how we write, write this. So typically use omega, right? It's a vector of B in A. Okay, so the right superscript is the body you're talking about, and then the left superscript is the one that's relative to, right? So B and A. So to read this out as omega of B and A. Um, so this is angular velocity of B in A, right? And that's defined as such, B1 times the time derivative of B2 in A dotted with B3. And I'll put uh, parentheses around there, right? That's a scalar, that dot product, plus a B2 component, which is D 
B3 DDT in A dotted with B1. plus the B3 component, which is D B1 DT dotted with B2. All right, so this is the definition of the angular velocity vector of B and A. Right? It's expressed in the B vector here. We have the time derivative of the unit vectors of B in A dotted with each of the unit vectors. Okay? So that's the formal definition. Um, it's a little cumbersome, probably, but uh, it's functionally useful. And we'll show a couple things. Does anybody not have that screen? So, if I, for example, take omega of B and A, and I cross it with the B1 vector, actually, it'd be nice to have that, that thing back on the screen. This is annoying. Let me just write, I'm going to rewrite it again really quickly so we have it. Actually, I'm on a computer, I can probably copy it. Let's see if I'm clever enough to copy it. Um, somewhere up here, lasso. I grab it and then uh, right click, copy, and then paste. Paste. Look at that. All right, that's slick. Right, let's bring this back here. Can even make it a little smaller. All right there's my definition. Now I'm going to write um, omega. Give my pen back. Omega of B and A crossed with the B1 vector. <clears throat> so that first component is in the direction of B1. What's, what's a B1 crossed with a B1? What's a, if I have the same vector crossed with the same vector, what do you get? Zero. zero. So the first component is zero. And I can distribute this like so. I can write B2 crossed with B1. Right? I can use the distributive property. And then that's going to be times what I have up here, db3 dt dot it with b1, and then plus b3 crossed with b1, and all that times a db1 dt b2 dot it with b2. Okay, and so these these cross products should be obvious too. What's b2 cross b1 in a right-handed oriented system. Negative D3. Yep. So if I cross these perpendicular vectors, what happened to my omega over here? Then I get negative B3 for that one. And um, also here, I get uh, what's B3 cross with B1? B2. All right, so I can sort of see, um, can use that function, get these uh, cross product between omega A and B. Um, so let's hold that right there. And then I want to mention a couple other details, right? What is the dot product of B1? dot the time derivative of b1 with respect to b1 what does that equal and remember that uh, oh that deleted it 
Remember that the magnitude of B1 equals 1. What's the dot product between the derivative of B1 and B1? If the magnitude is always 1. Clock is never right, huh? I said it. That's <clears throat> so if you have a, a vector of length one, it can't change in length and time, right? It can only rotate. So if it can only rotate, what direction would B1 be relative to B1, uh, B1 dot be relative to B1? Zero? I said, what direction? Angle, angle zero? Not angle zero. 90 degrees. All right, so if I have a vector and it's rotating and it never changes length, if, if I think about, you know, I'm going to drop my, drop my $100 pen, whatever. Um, you know, this, uh, the tip of that vector, say this is the tip since it's pointy, um, it's always going to be perpendicular. It might be different length, that velocity vector, depending on how fast it's spinning, but it's always perpendicular. So since that's always perpendicular, this equals zero. And um, the, you can also, if I write B1, dot it with B3, right, we know that that equals zero too. They're defined to be perpendicular. And then if I take the time derivative of that, I'll get B1 dot, dot it with B3, plus b1 dotted with b3 dot equals 0, right? So I have my product rule for differentiation of those. And then I can write that um, b1 dot times b3 dot times b3, excuse me, equals negative b1 dotted with b3, right? So that's a little nice relationship. Due to the perpendicular, uh, th those being perpendicular, I can swap the. Got that a little messy. B three equals B one dotted with B three dot negative. Right. So I can swap the derivatives and the sign to get that equated. So if I look at those. And I think about this omega cross B1 again, right? And I use this fact. In this fact, we can modify that omega 1, omega AB crossed with B1 equals, so I had negative B3, and here I have, I can just write it simply, is B3 dot, we know we're doing it in the A-frame, dotted with B1 plus B2, B1 dot, dotted with B2. All right? So I can, I can replace, I can use these two facts and replace things. Okay, these pages are annoying. I'm going to jump to next page. Anybody, everybody got that? Anybody not have that? Okay. So if I use those two facts, I can write this as omega of A and B crossed with B1 equals um, B1. And I can replace, um, I can just add a B1 component. And I know that B1 dotted with B1 is 0. Okay, so I can just add this in. This is, this is 0. And then B2, we can replace, leave that one as is. B1 dot B2. And then plus B3, B1 dot B3. All right, so now 
I've got three components of this vector, right? So I'm asking, like, what's omega of A and B, of B and A crossed with B1? And it's got three components, B1, B2, and B3. But notice that each of the scalars, right, each of the measure numbers there are the time derivative of B1 dotted with in the B1 direction. So if I had a time derivative vector of, B, of uh, B1 and I dot it into B1, B2, and B3, that's just going to give me the components of that time derivative vector. So this is just a simple way, I mean not a simple, a, compl a complicated way. All that equals to is B1 dot. You see that? So I have the one component, the first component, the B1 component of B1 dot, the B2 component of B1 dot, and the B3 component of B1 dot. So this is pretty cool, right? Omega of B in A crossed with some this vector B1 equals the time derivative of uh, B1. So I'll write this. Formally there, keep the reference frame. Right, omega v1, omega of b and a cross with v1 equals the time derivative of b1 in the reference frame. So this is a very, very nice and useful property. Equals a d b1 dt, and it's going to make our lives a lot easier when we're trying to figure out the time derivatives of vectors. If I know, right, say I want the time derivative of some vector, b1, and I know the angular um, uh, velocity, and I know that how that vector is, you know, I have that, know what that vector is, then I can easily calculate its time derivative. So this is super, super useful. So this is also true for an arbitrary vector. I'll call it beta bar. Uh, so A D beta bar D T equals omega of B and A crossed with beta bar, right? And so beta bar is a vector fixed in reference frame B. So this is super useful, all right? Questions on that? So we started with the definition of omega of um, B and A, and we derived this principle by looking at how omega of B and A, um, if I crossed it with this unit vector of B1 that's fixed in B, you know, what does that turn out to be? It turns out to give us this property. So really, that, that's the one that you should put your square around. All right, questions? Anybody seen this before? Remember it from Dynamics 101? Omega cross R, right? Omega cross R gives you velocity. This... Um, work for 2D planar stuff, right? It's just the angular speed, omega, crossed with r. So in the merry-go-round, om omega, as it was omega in one direction, in the three direction, crossed with r, which was in the b2 direction, and then we get 3 cross 2 is going to give us in the one direction, I think I screwed that up, uh, r was in the one direction, and then 3 cross 1 gives us in the two direction, and then the magnitude is just going to be omega times uh, the magnitude of this r. Okay, so this is the full 3D version of that simple omega times r equals v. Right? And so if you have an angular velocity vector and a, any other vector, we get the time derivative. 
All right, so we are at 10.56. Let's take a break for five minutes. We'll come back at 11, four, four minutes. Come back at 11, and then we'll move on, we'll move on from that. measure the time histories of the projections of each AI on each VI. Okay? And that means that we're going to I'll define some alpha i equals b1 dotted with ai. Beta i equals b2 dotted with ai. And uh, gamma i equals b3 dotted with ai. And then we have uh, I equals 1 to 3. Right? So the same thing we showed earlier with the direction cosine matrices. And so at any, at any given point, we know all 18 quantities here. Oh, and I said, um, sorry, I, did, I skipped that. Um, also, alpha i dot, beta i dot, gamma i dot. So the time derivatives of those scalars. Adding those, all 18 quantities. Okay? Nine angles and nine angular speeds. So then we have B1 equals alpha 1, A1 plus alpha 2, A2 plus alpha 3, A3. And um, same thing down here, alpha 1, A1, plus dot, dot. And B2 is, I'm sorry, that was gamma. And then beta 1, A1, plus dot, dot, dot. Right? So we have those vector B, all these unit vectors B and BI expressed in AI. And then we will um, look at the time derivative of, for example, B1 in A, and that's just going to equal alpha 1 dot A1 plus alpha 2 dot A2 plus alpha 3 dot A3. Why does it do that? It deletes my... Uh, things. So we can take these time derivatives like so, right? Because we have it expressed in the A-frame. We're taking the time derivative in the A-frame. So we just dot the scalars, the measure numbers. And that's the same for B2 and B3. If you plug this into the definition, does everybody, anybody not have that screen? So the next thing we'll do is plug these into the definition of the angular velocity that I showed a while back. And if you do that, you get something that looks like this. And 
I'm not going to do this in detail. You can go home and see how all this works out. But we basically get these expressions for the scalars expressed in the B frame now. Right, so now I have the angular velocity of B and A expressed in those 18 scalar terms in the B frame. If I just plug those into the um, definition of angular velocity in B and A, and this is the, let's write that out, angular velocity of B in A expressed in B, right? So if I were to measure all those things, right, I put sensors on whatever rigid body I have, and I measure the angles and the angular rates, um, I plug them all in, and I have the angular velocity vector expressed in B. So that's just a, a, little, a demonstration of the utility of that definition of omega A and omega B and A. Anybody not have that? So the next bit here I want to talk about is the, um, um, let's talk about simple angular velocity. We've already seen this, uh, but <clears throat> we can talk about it more, more specifically. It's very useful to um, utilize simple angular velocities instead of that big complex equation that you see. And um, let me just write out this sort of definition here. But So rigid body B has a simple angular velocity in reference frame A if there exists <clears throat> for a finite time t a single unit vector we'll call that k hat whose orientation is fixed in both A and B, right? This implies that K hat is the axis about which B is rotating in A, right? So a single unit vector that stays for any amount of finite time, it stays um, fixed relative to A and B. And that's the axis of rotation between A and B, and a single axis of rotation. So in this case, omega of B and A equals some scalar omega times k hat, with omega being the time derivative of that angle of rotation and stated more formally the angle between a line I'll call it LA fixed in A and a similar line, LB fixed in B, both perpendicular to k hat. All right? 
and omega is called the angular speed of B in A. All right? Chris? K hat is a unit vector that is aligned with the axis rotation in this case, yes. And that K hat, if I take two rigid bodies, right, that have simple rotation, actually the book itself is sort of like this, right? The axis K hat is going to be along that line. So if these are two rigid bodies and they are hinged by simple rotation, there's some vector K hat that stays fixed in both A and B for any any given time. And so that defines a simple rotation in, a, in theta is the angle between those two bodies and omega is the angular speed between those two bodies. Right? And uh, the direction of k hat will, uh, well, that's all we say. Right? So simple rotation. That's sort of the formal definition there. Where's my pen? Anybody not got that sheet? Okay, let me, let's go back to the, I think I've got this open here. Take a look at that gimbal that we had the other day and think about what the simple rotations are, right? So we have reference frames D, B, C, and A. And for example, Omega of A in D equals what? Got a hunch on that? Omega of D in A. First of all, is it a simple rotation? D in A. I mean, sorry, I'm saying that. Sorry, I'm saying that backwards. I apologize. Omega of A in D, is that a simple rotation? A is the main gimbal frame. D is the earth or the fixed, the sort of fixed frame, the background. Raise your hand if you think it's a simple rotation. Great. Nobody wants to speak, but you all know that the answer is now I know the truth. Now I know the truth. All right, we'll use raise hands before. So simple rotation. What is, how can, if we know now that we can write it as omega k hat, what would, uh, what would this simple rotation be? What what angle? What's first of all? What's what's the angle between those two frames? Q three. Sorry for the small font. Q three is this one. So between the background. The, ang the uh, gimbal spins about this, these joints through Q3. That's Q3, Q2, Q1. Q3, so the angle's Q3. What's, a, what's the angular speed if Q3 changes in time? What do you think? What's your name? Siddharth. Siddharth, that's right. What do you think the angular speed is? If the angle is Q3. If you know an angle, how would you get the um, angular, the, the derivative of the angle? I guess I'm saying the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Take the derivative. Take the derivative, right? So, dq3 dt in d, and I'll write it in shorthand, q3 dot, and then what direction is that rotation? a3, now we have a omega of a in d, so if I set q3 to 0, 
then A is aligned with D. And if, if we consider this a positive, right, um, if, I, if I increase the magnitude positively in Q3 and it rotates into this configuration, is the axis of simple rotation A3? What is it? Negative, right? So right hand, right hand rule, my rotation is out of the board and my thumb points down, negative A3. So this is going to be negative A3. Negative A3. Right, so that's, there's a simple rotation. Um, take a couple, take a few minutes. Think about what those two are. Write them down in your paper. Chat with your neighbor if you're confused. And then I'll come back with you for an answer. They go B and A and C and B. Q2 is the bottom one, and Q1 is the this one. I can write those bigger. Everybody's waving at me. I don't know why. You can continue to wave. <clears throat> we dynamicists like to wave with our right-hand rule. It is a uh, important tool. Important tool. Raise your hand if you got both of them. All right. Oh, do it again. It's too quick. So a few people. Take one more minute. Chat with your neighbor if you don't got it yet. And see if, or just at least see if you get the same answer from your neighbors.
So what's the omega B in A? Chris? Negative Q dot 2 A2? Raise your hand if you agree with that. Yeah, so it sounds like everybody pretty much got the right thing there. What is an equally valid answer? Negative Q2 dot B2. Right, so A2 and B2 are the same vectors in a simple rotation. Okay, so we've got Q2 is rotating about the negative sense about the B2 or the A2 unit vector. Right? What's the other one? Omega of C and B. Say it again, Siddharth. Q1 dot B1. Raise your hand if you got the same answer there. All right, good. People are getting it. Okay, so that's Q1 dot B1, and then what's the unequally equivalent? They're not drawn on the board, but I guess we can we can maybe assume assuming that they are similar um, vectors attached to C. I guess that's that's an awful question because they're not there. Um, we'll scrap that. All right, good. Simple rotation, okay, and uh, and you get simple angular velocities. Very nice. So. Why are we talking about all this? I want to show you the next quite important equation. So the main reason omega of B and A is, is useful is to relate the derivatives of a vector v in two reference frames. A and b. All right, so this magic equation that I'm about to write is one that you will need to stay alive in dynamics. So the derivative of some vector b, the time derivative of some vector v, in the reference frame A, is equivalent to the time derivative of that same vector, v, in reference frame B, plus omega of b in A crossed with the vector v. And v can be any vector. Okay? So this is a super useful rule. Right, if I know the velocity, the time derivative of, um, sorry, not the velocity, the one said. If I know the time derivative of, one, of this vector in, in reference frame A and happen to know how that reference frame is rotating with respect to the other reference frame, then all I have to do is add this cross product and then I get the derivative of V and A. Right? So this simplifies me, the derivatives that I'd have to take. I don't have to express V in A and take the time derivative of each measure number. Um, if I already have this, all I have to do is do this cross product, which is simpler than doing derivatives. Maybe. Maybe we can argue on that. Yeah, it is, because right, you can have really, really complex derivatives. So why is this true? Um, quick proof. Suppose that bi be a right-handed coordinate system fixed in B then vi some scalars are the vector v dotted with each of those unit vectors or you can write this as a v bar equals the sum from i equals 1 to 3 of vi bi, 
right? So this is just sort of a vector v expressed into the B frame. And then um, if we think about the, pro the time derivative of dt of, of vector v that we have there in A, that's going to equal, if we look at this um, sum here, right, we can use the product rule and we can get the sum of i equals 1 to 3 of dvi dt times bi, right? So the time derivative of each measure number is the first part of the product rule. The second part of that product rule, i equals 1 to 3 vi, we don't change, times dvi dt all in the reference frame A. Forgot that one there, right? So that was just the product rule of this express V in B, take the time derivative, and then we get these two sums using the product rule. And has so everybody got that sheet? Anybody not have that sheet? Next bit. Um, that dv dt in A then equals, that first part is simply dv dt in B, right? If you recognize from our definition of the time derivative in a reference frame, the first part is just that. And then plus the sum from I equals 1 to 3, vi, and if we use our definition that we learned from the angular velocity, we can transform dB i dt into omega b and a crossed with b i on that second part. So this is the def of d d t and b and um, I guess not definition, but uh, that omega A and B cross BI equals DBI DT and A. Right? So we can plug those in and then, then um, do a little more rearranging. We get DV, DT, B, the same thing, plus the sum from I equals 1 to 3. And we can move that scalar vi into the cross product. So we get omega of b and a crossed with vi bi. And then finally, dv dt in a equals dv dt in b plus vi, bi are just the components of v expressed in b. We can write this now as omega a and v getting sloppy crossed v. Right? There it is. So this simplifies your derivative taking significantly um, if you know the orientations of two frames relative to another. 11.30. Any questions there? On that? So you can go home and manually express vector v in A, pick some random vector, express it in A, take the time derivative of each measure number, and then also work this out and see if they're the same, right? Just plug in some arbitrary vector v. We can show how to do that in SimPy, too. Let's see, 1130. Um, let me, let's, let's open up SimPy, and I'm going to do, instead of writing this on the board, try to do this, I'll do this example with SimPy, and then let's look, and we'll look at a, how, um, how this works and how these derivatives 
can help us out, or how, how we can be helped out to do these derivatives in SymPy mechanics. So if you want to get your computer out, you can follow along. If you don't have a computer, um, I would encourage you to maybe sit one seat closer to Scott, and if you guys want to share some, um, it's always good. It's always good to type. Anybody else not have one? I think we look good. I need a. Oops. All right, so I'm going to open up, uh, go in my MA223 folder. I'm just going to create a new Python 3 notebook, and. <clears throat> Import SymPy as SM and import SymPy.physics.mechanics as ME. So the first thing, um, <clears throat> let's create. Let's think about this gimbal Q2, Q3. So we'll get these Qs in here. I'm going to make these functions of time. So how do I remember how I make these functions of time? When I create a symbol and I want it to be a function of time instead of a, just a scalar constant. Type tab after that ME and then tell me what, what it is supposed to be. See if you see it in the list there. If you, if you press tab key, dot tab key and look through the list. Oh, in fact, since I, uh, time underscore derivative. Oh, here, I, in fact, uh, I was going to give you, uh, how does this work? Anything? Anybody remember how to do this? I did it last time. How do you create symbols in SymPy? Symbols, the function symbols. Well, there's an equivalent called dynamic symbols that will automatically make functions of time. And I'm going to turn on the uh, printing. In fact, I'm going to turn on the vector printing so we'll get nice time derivatives. So Q1 and then Q1 dot div is a function of one variable I get Q dot. All right, so now these are functions of time, Q1, 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 Q3. And we have some reference frames. So if I um, create D equals ME reference frame, call it D. And then we've got another one, reference frame A. Um, we know that they are oriented relative to, to each other in a certain way. So if I want to orient a reference frame, I type A dot orient, and I'll do a question mark, and look at the help here. It says, defines the orientation of this frame, A, relative to a parent frame. In our case, A is, a, is what's the parent frame of A for the first rotation we'll do with respect to ground. Remember what that was in the gimbal? It was reference frame D. So we're going to orient A relative to D, the parent reference frame. And then it has some other options. You've got to tell it a type of rotation and the mount to rotate it through. And then this is an optional. 
if you look below the rotation type, we're going to get to some more complex rotations, but one of them um, is a simple uh, rotation about a single axis. So that's that keyword. So the rotation type, if we use axis, we can do simple rotations. And the amount is how much you have to rotate it. And depending on what you select here, the amount is going to be a different thing. And then that one was optional. So if we scroll down to the examples, the second to last example there is a rotate B with respect to N about a single axis, simple rotation. And then you have to provide it with the angle and a vector to, that represents the axis. So there's the angle and the axis. In this case, the example, it's more complex, but typically you often just have a single unit vector from your um, uh, one of your reference frames. So let's do that here. If I want to orient A with respect to D, we're going to use axis rotation. And then I'm going to provide it with a tuple here, the first object being Q3. And then A dot, what was it? A dot uh, 3. So that's going to be Z. And then it was a negative, right? Negative Q3 was the A, the A3. And I'll show you, if you want to use the numbers here, there's a way to do this. It's just a little more typing, but 3 corresponds to Z. So that will set a relationship between the two. But I get an error with a bad error message. And the reason for this is, is that... Um, a, to, a wants you to choose a vector that um, is expressed in D. Which I, so we're going to do DZ, which is the same. So if I do DZ, that works. All right. So DZ and AZ, or D3 and A3, are the same thing. So I oriented A with respect to D about a simple axis through a negative Q3 angle about the, D, the, the DZ. So <clears throat> we can easily get the direction cosine matrices now. So if I say D, DCM, says this gives you the direction cosine matrix between frames. So if I provide it with another frame, it should tell me what the direction cosine matrix is. So if I say, well, what, since I oriented those two, what, what does the DCM look like? And there it is. It gives me the direction cosine matrix with the proper cosines that represent that orientation. And so you can verify that with, with the sketch. If we go around D3, so if I have uh, D1, D2, right, so into the board is 3. If I rotate through some angle Q3 to get A1 and A3, then we can project A into D, and then this is the uh, cos Q3, sine Q3, and they're both positive. Should be, right? Oh, we did the, oh, I screwed up. What did I do wrong? This should be A2. That's one error. What's the other error? Right. 
Yep. It's supposed to be a knit through negative. So the, the uh, three vectors into the board on my sketch, and I rotate it positively. But we've defined a negative Q. So all that's wrong. So why you got to draw the little sketch, right? We're going, that's a negative Q3. And then this is going to be A1 and A2. No, sorry. Still getting things wrong. A1, A2. And then you project. And we get a negative in the 2, right? The negative sign. And a positive in the 1, which is why we see positive and negative there. So that's how you orient frames, and you get the direction cosine matrix. Um, we can continue on, like uh, the next frame is B, so you can create a reference frame B, and then B dot orient something. So B, if we look back at the gimbal, let me just open my book so I can remember. B was a B was a rotation relative to A about the negative A2 and B2 axis through the angle Q2. So see if you can create that orientation. Negative A2 B2 is the simple is the axis. The angle is Q2. B with respect to A. So you can write it two ways, about the negative B1, B2, A2, and then the angle is Q2. If you want to go ahead and add the, add the next one, um, C with respect to B is about the B1 equals C1 through the angle Q1. Yeah? Got something similar to that? Do I have mine right? And the negative sign could be here or here. And you get the same answer. You can either call it a negative vector or a negative uh, scalar. So then you can say, well, what's uh, C, DCM, 
B, right, and it gives you that A, um, sorry, B D C M A. You get that, right? So I can get my rotate my direction cosine matrices for any any of these relative frames. Now the other really nice thing is that I can now say C dot D C M D. Right, so I can walk down the chain, and there's my direction cosine matrix, which prints a little funny with that. I don't know why this this has been a bug, this little thing hanging down here. But anyways, we get a matrix now, and notice that these aren't trivial to necessarily going to be trivial to compute. Does anybody know how 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 this is computed? If we know the direction cosine matrices of all the other Individual pairs. Isn't what you said earlier, where you just kind of stack up those matrices and Correct. Yeah. Thank you for listening earlier. Good. So, for example, if I say A, D, C, M, D, and then B dot D, C, M, A, we get those two. And if I want to know B D C M A, if I want to know B relative to D, I can say B D C M A times A D C M D. Matrix multiply between those. And I get that direction cosine matrix, which should be the same as B D C M D. Right? So you have to multiply them in order, right? Matrix multiplication matters. So Here's B and D. You can think about that. They have to be on the ends, and then we have to connect with the, the same reference frames in the middle, right? On that, and so that gives me B D C M D, B D C M D, and that's how this is formed. So when I call this, all it's doing is that matrix multiplying. Chris. So, Yeah. Yeah, so I can do uh, B dot DCM A times B dot DCM D. Oh, sorry. A. And then I can hit enter instead of shift enter and do a second line. But it's only going to print out the last thing that you have on the line. Yeah, so so the default thing would be print. But notice that it prints sort of its raw computer form with the print command. There's a little magic going. When I do that init print printing, what it does is it says, um, it sort of changes some configuration stuff in the background, and it says, hey, if you're in the Jupyter Notebook, default to use, converting it to LaTeX and then rendering it. And it's a little... It's a little bit of pain to do it. If you do imp from i let's see i python dot display import latex and display right. If I do that, and then I do there's a latex command, and if I do uh, m dot dcm a Right, SymPy, SymPy has a function that converts any SymPy thing to all the LaTeX commands, if you're familiar with LaTeX. And then if I do, um, I think I've got to do a few things here. SymPy.LaTeX and the settings are, which one do I want? Uh, mode inline. So I can do D dot DCM A mode equals inline. And notice now it put it put dollar signs around it. So and then if I put all of that in the if I do display LaTeX and then put that in there, it displays it for me. So when I call init init printing, 
It's just doing all that automatically. So if you really want to, you could write a function, your own little function that does this, you know, that takes any SymPy object and then spits and then prints it. So you could create your own function if you want to have like a, an L print, LaTeX print or something. You could make one up and then help, and help you to debug in between those two. Um, it has a debugger also. So if you're getting an error in one um, thing and it has this long trace back and you want to look through what the, what's going on, uh, you, can, you can turn on the debugger like this, PDB. And then if I um, do a syntax error, for example, um, what's a syntax error? Open, just an open quote probably, syntax error. I don't know why. It, I guess there's, there's no deep trace back there. But you, you can look that up if you want to know more about debugging. Um, I'm not going to get into, into it there, but there's other, there's other ways to debug live inside this thing if you want to. Okay, where are we at? <clears throat> so we've got now, remember that we had a vector P. First, let's create the uh, radius of the gimbal disk. So that's going to be a constant symbol. I'll call it capital R. And then we had a vector P equals R times C dot, I think it was in the two direction, right? So Y. So there's our vector P that was from the center of the disk in the gimbal to some point on the gimbal. So if you look back, I think that's right. All right? So that makes sense, right? R in the CY direction. That's all it was. Super simple. Well, all vectors have a method called express. So maybe I want to express that vector in the B frame. It will automatically use the direction cosine matrices and re express R CY in terms of the B-frame, right, if you've set these orientations, okay? So that's very useful. It becomes ex especially useful when you have these long chains. So if I go all the way back to D, here's my expression P expressed in the D-frame. So if I projected that P vector all the way back in the D-frame, there we are, right? Am I going over time? Well, I got, uh, oh, I am going over time. Sure. We got to stop. <laughs> okay, I'll post this stuff and we'll, we'll uh, come back to it on Monday. All right, and I would suggest, um, I'll, put, I'll add problems too for the, they're already on the website, but problems for chapter two. You know, if you're, if you're done with ch the chapter one, you should start mo be moving into chapter two there. All right, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm over time, so I want to clean up, and you can chat with me out in the hall.